So today is the 1st of March, 2022. Um, we're here with Dr. Greta Kammermeyer. And I am Diane Barrett from the B for the BE collection. This is my partner, spouse, Margaret Elfring. The E, the E <laughs> part of the BE. So I was happy to know that your partner's name is also Diane. Is that with, with, yeah, with uh, with one end. With that one end. Yeah. Well, we'll honor that. We hope that we can interview her one day too. Never know. <laughs> I know things happen. It's um, we started the collection a year ago, February, and we were retired. Um, Marge, is an orthopedic surgeon. I'm a registered nurse and psychotherapist, and. Uh, we were bored because we were locked up with COVID. Mm -hmm. So I thought, what is it I like to do? I like people's stories. And Marge, who has supported me for 45 years. Go <laughs> come. That's a joke. She ran my office. Yeah, for part of my career. That's what nurses do. Uh -huh. We do a good job of it too. Yes, I could, when, we had an event that she was out of the office for a month or more. I said, when the income starts to drop, <laughs> you come back in. And it did. Mm -hmm. When it got you know down 10, 20%, I said, okay, back in. <laughs> we met at L LA County Hospital. I was a head nurse in orthopedic surgery and she was a resident there. And that started the relationship. Then she moved after her residency to Santa Maria for a while. Huh? Well, I yeah. moved first to Kaiser and then mm -hmm. returned to Santa Maria. And I um, returned to school and got my degree in counseling and set up a practice in Los Angeles. Yeah. So it was sort of a natural progression just to do that and practice built. She's a fabulous doctor, if I do say that myself. <laughs> and, uh, I was not a good first assistant. I always tell everybody I want to see, so I would be this way instead of this way. <laughs> so I had to be corrected a lot, but um, I could, we handled that. We adopted a daughter that same year, 1994. But you've had three children, four children? Four, yes. Four. Uh, well, yeah, I have three living children. I, I had four children and three living. Uh -huh. When did you lose one? Uh, 2007, in an accident, um, and you never get over it. Not sure, that's true. What was his name? Andy. Mm -hmm. And what's what was the sequence in the relationship? In terms of, was he the firstborn or? Uh, he was the third. Third. But you're you're absolutely correct. You don't get over it. How long were you married to your husband? I uh, was married for 15 years. Do you have contact with him at all now? No, uh, he, um, the, the condition on which he would be in contact with me uh, that he sort of passed through our kids was um, mm -hmm. if I got married and um, uh, sort of changed my ways. And uh, I got married, but I didn't change my ways. <laughs> you liked your ways. That's yeah. why you got married. Yep. Yeah. When did you get married? Uh, well, we've been Diane and I've been married mm -hmm. three different times, uh, <clears throat> and the last time when it was legal, legal was uh, mm -hmm. in two thousand twelve. Good. We say the same thing: married three times to the same person, no divorce. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, we understand that, and they were all different. Were all your celebrations of marriage different? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, one was in Oregon that was later nullified. Then another was here in the state of Washington uh, that, uh, you know, was first uh, a civil union. And then our uh, final one was here with a, um, a mayor. Uh, we had a celebration here at our home and opened it up to friends. So we ended up having 10 separate weddings here in the same afternoon. Well, well, that was a great idea. I like that. Uh, yeah, and it and and it uh, preceded it, it preceded an annual party that we had. So we mm -hmm. also then had food and the reception for everyone to celebrate. So it was, um, you know, ten for for the price of one. <laughs> I know a bargain. That's a great idea. Do you get together then 
to celebrate your anniversaries? Uh, not really. I mean, we uh, it's not that we were really super close before, but it was more a, a circle of friends uh, who had, uh, you know, strong, committed relationships and chose to uh, participate because it was easy when somebody else sets it everything up. Right. And all they had to do was to show up, get have their marriage license and then show up. It has up. an appeal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, where in Portland were you married? Uh, you know, at the courthouse. You know, we might have been at that same wedding. We did, um, I don't know, what year was it? Oh, was that the 2004? I th or three, three, I think. Because we were um, going on vacation uh, to the coast of Oregon. We got off the plane. We knew that this marriage was available. We went to the courthouse. We didn't know anybody. There were people everywhere. And um, cost us $60. It was like the whole city was getting married. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, was it was very fun. It was you know, a happy time. Yeah, yeah. it was. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look on the check because they returned my check. Right. I, I, I remember <laughs> that too, yes. We, yeah. Yeah. I guess it's over. Yeah. Here's $60, have a dinner. <laughs> yeah. But so we were probably, um, we could have been at the same place at the same time because we were in the courthouse. And uh, there were uh, there were a few other people in the courthouse too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It was crowded. It was really crowded. Yeah. And we didn't have anyone as a witness, so we just picked a couple people that were there. Uh, the judge had a couple of clerks mm -hmm. that uh, she brought in, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she commented on how it was the. Uh, the most fun she had had in terms of uh, being a judge. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was. It was a fun evening. Yeah. And the Hall of Portland seemed to be gay. Yeah. It was pretty. I like that. Where were you born? Uh, uh, Oslo, Norway. Mm -hmm. And uh, during, during the Nazi occupation in uh, Norway. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Well, you know, I, I don't remember much. Um, mm -hmm. We lived across from Nazi headquarters wow. and my parents were involved with uh, the Norwegian resistance. Mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I can relate to the Ukrainian issue now and uh, sort of fighting for your own existence. Mm -hmm. It's tragic. Yeah. You feel, I feel helpless. Exactly. And, yeah, I don't know. Um, I can't change it. And it's a frightening time too. Uh, it's, it, they're dangerous times. Mm -hmm. So how long did you stay in Norway? Well, I, uh, as I say, I was born uh, during the Nazi occupation in Norway. My parents were part of the Norwegian underground. And after the war, my father was the first uh, Norwegian to receive a Rockefeller Fellowship. And we ended up going to Boston where we were for nine months and then went back to Norway and then finally um, immigrated to the United States in 1951. Uh, I was nine years old and uh, coming to a new country with not knowing anyone, not speaking the language or understanding the language. It was, uh, you know, pretty traumatic uh, and uh, sort of lonesome. Um, because you had, I mean, your network was your family. So we have an interview with Michelle Victor. She's a um, social worker and she came from England and uh, she felt that same isolation. People made fun of her accent, even though she spoke English <laughs> and children did. And uh, she talked to that. And since that time, people actually look at these videos, which I'm happy about. People say, I can really relate to that. Mm -hmm. And that's a time when you really want to be accepted too in your own development. They made fun of her little accent, which she still has, and now we like it. <laughs> well, the sort of the biggest um, event for me as I was uh, walking to, to elementary school was uh, we settled in the Washington, D.C. area where it's really hot and humid. And uh, as you know, I was short at the time. I'm not short now. Um, and I would pick, I would pick um, leaves uh, 
off of bushes as I was going to the, the school and would put them over my eyelids to oh. cool my eyes and then would end up coming home with my eyes scratching and all swollen. And it turned out that I had picked up um, poison ivy leaves. Oh my goodness. And, uh, so uh, that was sort of an introduction to, uh, well, poison ivy, among <laughs> other things. Uh, turned out that both my mother and I were extremely sensitive to it. Wow. Um, but uh, you know that didn't exist in Norway, so this was a new experience, to say the least. No poison ivy in Norway? No, not. I mean, not that I uh, was ever aware that's of. That's interesting. I went on a brownie trip with my mother and other brownies, scouts, and we went to a nature preserve. We picked up all these leaves and we brought them to the head preserve master. And he went through each leaf and identified it. And he said, oh, this is poison ivy. And of course, we picked a lot of that because it was colorful. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> My mother was not too happy about that because she had to report back to all the parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was a colorful leaf. I'm surprised. Huh. So you were picking color. I was picking, I think, damp leaves <laughs> because of the Action. dew on them in the mornings. Mm -hmm. But now you know exactly what they look like. I don't pick leaves anymore. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm a leaf person. I, growing up in the Midwest, I, I like color changes. So I'm a floral designer, so I like leaves for that too. Oh, nice. So then, um, what award did your father receive? Uh, he was, uh, th this was the Rockefeller Fellowship. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, he, that. He was a neuropathologist and mm -hmm. so uh, was invited to Boston to work with uh, Ray Adams, who was sort of the, the father of neurology. And um, so, you know, he was doing his medical work and, and research there. And uh, after the completion, we, as I say, we went back to Norway and then ultimately uh, he was invited. And as a result, we too came with to um, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in Washington, DC. And after a number of years, um, moved over to the National Institutes of Health, where he worked for the rest of his career. Was he proud to receive those awards? Sounds like a man of status in his profession. Well, you know, he was, this was his work. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was more a, a scholarship uh, and mm -hmm. a fellowship. And right. he was of course, pleased with that, but uh, he, he was uh, just doing his job. Mm -hmm. Did you want to be a physician? Of course. <laughs> well, I don't know. How yes, I wanted to that? be a physician, but uh, not like my father, uh, mm -hmm. but because um, uh, we had some clashes in terms of personality and things, mm -hmm. but, you know, medicine was in my, my blood by that time. But uh, when I went on to college, I had a little too much fun and uh, ended up um, not doing well academically. And so went from pre-med to nursing and ended up then uh, completing uh, my nursing degree and uh, then went on active duty in the military. Uh, so that's, that's sort of how my entree into the military began and uh, ultimately uh, you know, worked for 31 years by the time you cut it all up in terms of discharges and then reinstatements and things. So I went um, uh, in and out of the military of active duty, the uh, reserves and the National Guard during my total 31 years. And then I had a con 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 concurrent career um, after my seven years of active duty in the VA. Uh, wow. So I worked in the VA for 27 years. After or concurrent? Con so, uh, concurrently. Uh, which did you prefer? Well, the advantage of the, the VA was that you could um, stay home. Uh, the advantage of the reserves was that you were on call and could be activated at any time, uh, 
the advantage of the National Guard is that you are there for your state and for state emergencies. So, so each had its, uh, its pros and cons. Uh, and the fact that, uh, you know, by, by this, by the time I, well, maybe I should backtrack just a little bit. <laughs> it'll, it'll make it easier. We have all the time. Yeah. We have so a lot of time. I went on active duty. I um, served in Texas and uh, then in Fort Benning, Georgia, ended up going to Germany where I met my husband and we were married, then returned to the United States at the time of the buildup for Vietnam. Uh, he was um, given orders to go to Vietnam and I volunteered. Uh, his orders were canceled, mine were not. So I ended up going to Vietnam first and then his unit came over later. And uh, after Vietnam, uh, well, towards the end of it, we decided that we wanted to start a family. And um, I was uh, pregnant, but women couldn't be in the military and have dependents. So I was forced to leave the military. Uh, and uh, with a prior, just prior to the birth of my first son in 1968, uh, then the policy changed. And uh, so I was able to go back into the military in 1972 and um, then ended up with a total of four kids uh, with a military career, first active duty, then the army reserves. How did you manage all that? Well, uh, actually my aunt ended up living with us. Ah, good. So she helped uh, you know, deal with the kids and everything. And, um, you know, it, it worked. I mean, as, as you know, uh, anything can work out. You just figure out the path yeah, and, and go at it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, then I, um, I was in the Army Reserves for, um, I guess, you know, 10, 15 years and uh, then had the opportunity to become chief nurse of the Washington State National Guard. And so transferred from the reserves to the National Guard and finished my career uh, there. Not, again, not uneventful because I, by this time wanted to become a general and uh, as part of a, well, I, I, should, I should add that I divorced my husband after 15 years and what was uh, the, what led you to that were you aware of your sexuality at that time or yeah I, I i don't think you know i really had internalized anything by that time but it just didn't feel right and i was really depressed and i was suicidal wow okay. and uh so ended up leaving the marriage uh mm -hmm. it was not amicable and the kids were sort of feeling torn. Uh, they stayed with their father and I had visitation uh, with them. And uh, so that was going on at the same time. And you were able to talk to your husband about what was happening with you and why no, you had to uh, uh, that, that just didn't work. <laughs> uh, well, you'll find as you uh, review uh, these, many of us were suicidal. Yeah. And, uh, it was not unusual. In fact, that's one of the reasons we started this collection was we knew a young woman who came out as lesbian much later in life. She was a friend of our daughters when they were little and um, she tried to kill herself and she almost made it. Yeah. But some this, They scooped her up, she went to UCLA, she got therapy, and now she's doing fine. But look at all the people that, and I'm hoping some of them will see this and maybe not kill themselves. We don't know who did. No, you know, it's a terrible thing, but it's a choice. You get to that bottom line and you're there. I, I can relate to it personally myself. So I'm yeah. glad you didn't. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it is, it is a journey of, mm -hmm. of life right. and, and recognizing, uh, you know, and getting help and trying to figure out what, what is the least common den denominator in, in terms of being able to keep you alive. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was the need to get away from my marriage. And it wasn't that it was a bad marriage, uh, but uh, I just needed not to be there. Uh, and then 
so I, I divorced. I continued working with uh, the VA. I, How old were you then when you divorced? Oh, uh, let's see. So that was 19, probably 38 or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, then, uh, you know, it, it's like, <laughs> I'm not sure which, which trajectory to, to go, but uh, I... Uh, uh, so I had, I had, um, while I was in the reserves, I was also working in the VA and, um, uh, then got, uh, ended up getting a master's degree and, uh, then later decided to get a PhD and, uh, got a PhD, um, in 1991, uh, just about the time when I had just previously met Diane and had sort of the aha moment mm -hmm. of recognizing that this was who I really connected with emotionally. How did that feel? Uh, well, it was, it was sort of reassuring about life that uh, there really could be somebody that, that cared for you and that you cared for enough. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was a journey also. Uh, uh, a journey to understand yourself, understand relationships, understand that uh, society didn't necessarily approve of your relationship. But, you know, if you don't need societal approval, you cherish the relationship that you have. Never have one. You're waiting for that. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, because homosexuality was not compatible with military service, according to military um, uh, military regulations. Uh, at the same time, uh, it, it, no, I went for a top secret security clearance and in the course of that security clearance, not wanting to lie, not wanting to ever feel that I had uh, not been perfectly truthful during that, I said that I was a lesbian. I wonder if I should say this or not. Any hesitation? With yeah, I, I, I did have some hesitation, mostly in the fact that I, I wasn't quite sure what the ramification would be, uh, even though when I told Diane what I had said, she said, your uh -oh. career is over. Um, but I, I had been in the military by that time for 25 years. I was a colonel. I was mm -hmm. just finishing up my PhD. I'd served in Vietnam. I was recognized both uh, uh, with awards, both from the military and for from the military and thought maybe I could be the conduit for changing military policy. Uh, I, I had no idea. <laughs> I'm sorry. And you were correct. You, you are. Well, I mean, but what I didn't know was of the thousands of others who had tried to do the same before me and had, had not succeeded. Uh, and this was, you know, living in a naive bubble. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it just felt as though um, I, I could perhaps be the conduit for the, yeah. that. And six months later was told that I was gonna be discharged from the military. And, uh, and I was devastated. Yeah. <clears throat> I had you know, served by that time for, for 25 years or 27 years, I could have retired. But that was not my intent. My intent was to try to change the policy, just as years before someone had changed, worked to change the policy of women being allowed to serve uh, even though they had dependents. Uh, so it just, you know, it just seemed like it was my turn to take a stand. And, you know, in my. Uh, my do you know the history of how the 
anti-gay thing actually developed, just like the dependents and women. And I mean, how did that get in there that we couldn't be lesbians? And well, it, this this you know started uh, evolution you know, of it. Yeah, well, it you know it essentially started with uh, General von Steuben working for for um, uh, General Washington at the time of the revolution. He was the first gay general, yeah. really. Yeah, I didn't know that. Good yeah, enough. Came, came, from, came from France and helped organize uh, how, to, how to train the military, mm -hmm. uh, but um, came with his two boys uh, as part of his entourage from, from, uh, from France. But was, his two boys were not his sons. No, they were not. Okay. Uh, and um, but at the same time as he had General von Steuben working for him, he also had the first uh, discharge uh, of of um, a, a gay men uh, from the military, and that's sort of the history of where it began. And then it sort of now. How did dormant. you find all that? Pardon me. I I did. How did you find all that information? Well, I'm know. learning it now, but, but I'm fine with that, that I didn't know it. But I mean, that's a lot of research. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, some years ago, I think it was in, in Kansas City or in, in um, it was somewhere in the Midwest where mm -hmm. a gay men's chorus was doing a history of gays in the military. Mm -hmm. and, and this, if, uh, you know, I came to know about it through that history and through the songs that they, they created. Uh, but, you know, since then- Let me hold you. Do you know that Kelly? Kelly's- huh? No, that's cool. Kelly is an entertainer. Oh. As well as he's our guide here, but uh, he's a singer. He's a beautiful oh, voice. Yeah. yeah, so this was- and Now I just learned something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and, and then uh, with World War II, uh, there was also this anti-gay sen sentiment that homosexuality was a mental illness. And as a, uh, as a result, uh, it would not be compatible with, with military life. And uh, so that was sort of uh, created so that instead of having gays sent to jail, they were discharged from the military. And then over time, you had these purges that would take place of, of women in the military and men in the military, you know, it, it you know, the, uh, the, the Navy and the, and the army particularly were really targeted and especially uh, women that played softball. Uh, some, somehow was playing movie. softball. Was <laughs> <laughs> so, my, my lesbians. Yeah. So you had the softball teams and then you had the gay bars and, uh, you know, so it, it, it was not unlike the, the uh, persecution uh, around Stonewall. And so, it, but there was a parallel system uh, within the military itself. And so what started out as you couldn't be in the military, if you were found out, you were discharged and would get a, a dishonorable discharge. And- uh, so They would lose all their benefits and everything then. Oh yeah, that would, yeah. yeah but you know, so the, the, the stigma- The economics of it were pretty vast. Well, but the social stigma and the personal right. stigma of, of getting a dishonorable discharge just because of who you were, uh, you know, and people would hide that discharge and yet would carry it inside for the rest of their lives. And uh, How about so, you? I'm you sorry? You know that you've come to the other side of it? Do you carry that with yourself? Well, I, I had a totally different experience. Right. You okay, know, good. Um, uh, I was discharged. Uh, before don't ask don't tell I mean that's that's where my discharge took place but I was also standing on principle and then I had legal teams with Lambda Legal and uh, the Northwest Women's Law Center that supported me through my entire ordeal and uh, so when I came out at the other side it was the vindication of my challenge to the military was I was reinstated Mm -hmm. I and know that's great. The, you know, so that the the policy as it existed was ruled by my judge unconstitutional. And during that same time was when uh, candidate Clinton was running for president, 
and said that he would overturn the ban against gays serving in the military. And the six months of the first six months of his of his tenure had to do with fighting for gays being allowed to serve in the military. And an untenable compromise uh, was the don't ask, don't tell. Uh, so you couldn't tell anybody, you couldn't disclose without fear of losing your career. And so you still had the risk then, of, right. gee, if you don't have sex with me, I'm going to say you're a lesbian and you're going to lose your career, which is what happened. And during those 17 years of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, we, we still lost over 14,000 uh, gays and lesbians from service in the military. Uh, yes. And so it wasn't until uh, 2010 when President Obama signed the repeal that, you know, that burden was lifted. And people now who were discharged dishonorably or did not have get their benefits that they were entitled could appeal their discharge and then uh, have their, uh, their discharge upgraded so that they would be entitled to benefits. And in some cases, people would uh, request to go back into the military. So there's been a whole, uh, you know, over 200 years uh, to get that policy uh, and then law Amazing. changed. Amazing. Yeah. So it was, this? I'm sorry. Do you teach? You're a great teacher. Do you, do you teach? Oh, I, I, used, I, I used to. I mean, what nurse doesn't teach? <laughs> but do you teach that about the 200 okay. years? And yeah, when I uh, when I was discharged uh, in 2002 uh, because I was a lesbian, mm -hmm. uh, I began giving university lectures Good. and I gave about 200. Uh, and, and that was before the days of PowerPoint. <laughs> where, where you had to have slides made uh, to be able to do that. And, uh, and uh, so, yes, between the movie Serving in Silence and then my own autobiography with uh, the same name uh, and I'm still being asked periodically. And one of my grandsons um, uh, and uh, as part of his high school um, history lesson, uh, he talked about me, and so his his um, a teacher invited me to come and give a couple of talks at his high school. Really, that's great. Uh, which, Good for him. I, and, you know, I thought, <laughs> I, you know, it's look how far we've come. I know that's great. Uh, yeah, and so to be be part of that, I think, uh, I mean, it it's like if somebody wants you to to talk about it or to tell your story then the most important thing, just as what you're doing in terms of interview, is allowing people the opportunity to hear your story so that you can sort of self-define and they can make decisions for themselves or can learn what the, perhaps what their own trajectory is. And own aha uh -huh moments come out of this. Yeah. 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 yeah, you're correct. So are there relatives besides yourself that are gay in your family that you know about? Uh, let's see, not that I am, uh, I am aware of, but I've, I've, there've been some interesting uh, outcomes of, of all of this. Uh, one of my grandsons was just uh, interviewing for uh, a firefighters, a firefighting job. And uh, it turns out that his, his uh, immediate superior was a woman. And as he was doing his prepping for how he would answer the questions, um, his mother asked, well, you know, what if she asks if you can work for a woman? And he said, well, you know, my grandmother is an army colonel and she puts up with dealing with males uh, all the time and she is my role model. Oh, and uh, nice and I thought, well, I guess he's learned something <laughs> coming to visit here. Uh, um, but, um, and another grandson, um, uh, he, he was playing on a on a basketball team, and uh, one of his um, teammates started getting harassed because he was presumed to be gay. 
And um, uh, so this grandson, uh, you know, just told his teammates to stop uh, harassing him and that this young man could could be his roommate anytime uh, when they were traveling. And it was just, you know, just not a big deal. And uh, later that day, his mother received a phone call from this boy's mother who said that because of what my grandson had done in terms of supporting him, his her son no longer felt that he needed to commit suicide. Wow. wow. You know, and, and those sorts of, yeah, you know, it, it's like you don't always you don't know, know where people are at. Yeah, and, and the influence that, that just being exposed to you uh, may have on someone else's life decisions and how they can support people regardless of who they are because of who they are. Stunning. No, I, we are um, inspiring the future. There's no doubt in my mind. You're a big part of that. So we did see your movie, March and I watched the movie. And um, did you and Diane feel that it represented the two of you? Very, very much so when, uh, when all was said and done, you know, it, it was, uh, and it was almost the whole thing was accurate in good. terms of, of context and everything else. But, um, you know, when we agreed to do it, we were in the middle of the lawsuit also. So it was very important that uh, it didn't flip, it didn't become, you know, s sensationalized. Right. Uh, and that it, it stayed true to the facts. And so they sent us the 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 manuscript uh oh. or, you know the, the 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 play itself and everything and so diane and i diligently went through and changed uh the whole text because oh, we wanted it to be <laughs> reflective of our relationship and how we right. talk to one another well you know it's a it's a movie already <laughs> and and so it's not it, it turns out that it really was our story but it really wasn't just about us it right. was about any gay relationship, and 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 the theme with the military was obviously uh, <clears throat> the big, uh, you know, the the center of it all, and uh, so we we put all of this energy into it, and they just did away with that and went back to the original script as it had been written, uh, but we felt very um, very respected uh, yeah. in in that uh, film uh, and it really reflected our, our journey also. Good, that's good. Yeah, and you know, the film got three Emmys and uh, you know, Glenn <laughs> Close and, and uh, Judy Davis and the playwright all uh, were recognized for, mm -hmm. for their effort. And uh, so uh, it, it, I think- I enjoyed it. I, I think it was, uh, if you put it into the context of the day mm -hmm. and it was made for television. And so you, uh, you really have to understand how significant having a positive character, um, a, 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 a positive depiction of gays and lesbians uh, was, was a rare thing uh, in those right. days. Uh, and Who so approached you to even participate in the movie? Well, I got a call from Barwood Studios uh, as I was driving to work one day, and I had no idea what Barwood st Studios were. And they said, well, we're calling on behalf of Barbara Streisand. And it was like, oh, yeah, I recognize that I name. I know that name. <laughs> yeah. and, and then with my attorney, went down to speak with her and to NBC and to talk about it. And I said, uh, Barbara said, uh, well, wouldn't you like to have your life story told on television to 25 million people? And I said, no, not particularly. And she said uh, that she considered this the most important social issue of the decade. Uh, that was, I read that someplace. I thought yeah. that was a fabulous statement. Yeah, and, and so then it was the important thing was for us to just back away. And of right. course, uh, as long as you know, we had oversight in terms of making sure that it was accurate. Mm -hmm. That's and good. So that was uh, that was really important. Now that's one of the, um, obviously your relationship um, was tested and it's uh, during this whole period of time. 
that's one of the things when we do the couples interviews that people uh, are interested in how couples get through these things and one of the reasons um, when i i say to people well, how did you hear about us and they say well i saw that um to have and to hold that's one of the that's the couples interviews and they are drawn to that because everybody wants a relationship like you have and that can weather storms and can have joy and uh, resilience and so they're taught they're given hope by those things so if you want to uh, tell that story with diane we'd be honored to have that yeah well it, i mean i think the, the the film depicts it somewhat also mm -hmm. in terms of um how we met and uh, i think you know we were talking the other day about you know, we've been together now almost 34 years. And uh, what we have in common are things like our values uh, and our mutual respect for one another. And the fact that we have no idea of what the other person is doing in terms of their careers. I mean, Diane is an artist. Uh, right. She's visual. She's um, highly read, uh, interested in uh, the historical Jesus and, and, you know, is, is really a scholar, mm -hmm. you know, give me a piece of flesh and blood and uh, a, a medical issue. And that's where my focus is. And, and, uh, you know, I, I'm a hospital commissioner uh, mm -hmm. here at, on the Island where we live. And so, and had an adult family home here for 15 years. So did caretaking uh, that, still is an integral part of, of who I am. And uh, so, you know, we mesh uh, in, a, in a curious way and oh, have, have that much. respect, yeah. So what's your dream for your future? To die healthy. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, do you want to set the date or? <laughs> no, I mean, that's the uncertainty uh, because, uh, you know, we have had so many people around us now at our age. I turn 80 in a few days and Diane is 86. And so we are both in pretty good shape. Uh, but we have seen our friends uh, die from bad diseases, uh, yes. from cancer, from heart disease, from dementia. You know, we do cognitive assessments on one another on a regular basis or you know, can you find that word uh, and uh, because <laughs> there is that that part of you know I, I you don't want to become what you have seen and had uh, have had to do to help other people and and I think that's probably our greatest concern um, but related to that too yeah good so if you knew that you were going to um, die in a few days, what would you like to be remembered for? Living my truth mm -hmm. uh, and um, standing up against the largest government in the world. I know. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, having the team to support that. Mm -hmm. You made good choices for your team, I think. Well, I was very fortunate and uh, even I, I had no idea that Lambda Legal existed uh, except through some friends who, as, as they heard my story, said, you know, contact Lambda. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, nowadays I think uh, it is more well known that there are legal teams like the uh, National Center for Women's Right, mm -hmm. uh, the Lambda Legal, uh, you know, here in Washington state, there's also legal voices so that you have places where you can go if you're downtrodden and uh, that they will help in many cases find uh, pro bono attorneys uh, if you need help. Who paid your legal fees? It was pro bono. It was. Good. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's nice to know that that's there. So do you, in closing, do you have questions you'd like to ask me? Things you'd like to say that you haven't said? No, I think uh, I, I, it's been a little fragmented and <laughs> trying to trying to put a lifeline together and then with all of the little nuances in between. But I, I think the important thing for, uh, for anyone that might be looking at this is that, you know, you can be gay 
and lesbian and still have long lasting, wonderful life and relationships uh, and not to be intimidated by someone who tells you that that's not possible. So thank you. Well, and thank you. Stay in touch. Yep. Well, thank you very much. We're honored. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.